by uh, Martin. Uh, he is going to talk about uh, hypermedia and uh, his, uh, his view on how this should be done with, uh, with uh, more path and React uh, frameworks. So uh, if you never met Martin before, but you have ever used uh, XML with Python, chances are high that you are using his code. But I will let him talk about other things. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, I'm Martijn Faasen, I'm from the Netherlands, my wife is Singaporean, which is why I'm here on a regular basis. Uh, Happy New Year. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'm a developer and a consultant. Um, uh, I've been a Python developer and a web developer for a while. Um, I was very much involved with SOAP. If you want to read about me not being involved in SOAP anymore, the history about SOAP, I blogged about it, it's called my exit from SOAP. Uh, helped create or initially started creating, uh, started it, uh, the Grok project, which was a uh, web framework to try to simplify some of the uh, uh, SOAP technologies. Uh, I wrote a, uh, a client site, a sort of model view framework nobody ever heard about, uh, called Ovial, but you'll hear about more later in this talk. And most recently I've uh, created a, yet another Python web framework called MorePath, and I talked about it last year, and I will talk a little bit about it again this year. Um, I also was involved uh, starting the European Python series of conferences and I was board member of the Zoop Foundation for a while and yeah, the software that most people use that I've written uh, haven't been, there's been a very competent other maintainer, uh, Stefan Benel, since almost the beginning when I did start the project, uh, it's called LXML, which is uh, if you use XML in Python in a serious way then you're likely to run into it. Um, so uh, yeah, initially I said I will talk about MorePath and, and React. When I was writing this talk, of course I'm sort of talking about what I'm working on right now. So uh, I, it focuses around hypermedia. So I'll talk a bit about what is hypermedia, uh, why would we want a hypermedia driven UI. I'll go into what that even is later. Uh, some ideas towards the framework for constructing hypermedia based UIs. And we will talk about MoPath and React uh, uh, somewhat, so uh, it will still be about that. Uh, this is a bit of a dangerous sign. Usually I talk about stuff that sort of works already. Uh, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about now is speculative, ongoing work, uh, uh, just got started, etc. Um, so let's talk about extensibility first. Extensibility. So. Uh, when you write, design a application or a framework for extensibility, you try to have an implementation that takes future growth uh, into consideration. You, uh, and uh, when you do this, you, you you can of course you know change the behavior of a system by just changing the code, and that's often fine. Uh, but often, if you want to reuse that code, it makes sense to follow the open close principle, which is this idea that you have a core code base and you plug in plugins into it or extensions or, or you override bits of it um, uh, and, and by that way you extend the behavior of the system uh, and you try to avoid, of course you can't always do it, just always changing the same core code base over and over again because uh, you want to reuse it in multiple uh, settings. Uh, do we need extensibility is uh, uh, sort of the first question you can ask about this. Well, in, in, in many cases we don't. If you write a script perhaps, it doesn't need to be extensible or a one-off web application that's sort of very fixed and it presents a very fixed user interface, doesn't really need to change very much over time uh, or you, you're fine by change, uh, but if you need to change it, you just change its code base, you don't need to extend it, you don't have multiple deployments of it. Uh, if you make a smartphone app, Typically, they don't need to be extensible as well. Uh, but you know, th those tend to be the applications that everybody sees and talks about uh, because they're very visible to the general public. But many, much software development, I would say most software development is sort of underwater, which is uh, sort of the iceberg of custom applications for businesses or in-house software, etc. Uh, there's a lot of software development going on there, and you also have the general business model where you have uh, um, some core system like a CMS or an ERP system and you want to deploy it in mo for multiple customers and those systems tend to need extensibility very much and that's just, there's a lot of work going on in that. Um, 
Mm. And another sort of more abstract reason why you might need extensibility is if you want to build an application that you want to last for a while. Uh, you want it to exist not just like in half a year, but maybe in a few years time or even 10 years, uh, which is enormous time span in, in the lifetime of software. Uh, so how would you make, how do you make applications or frameworks more extensible? Uh, and one way to do that is, is to, to follow the hypermedia architectural pattern, which is what I'm going to talk about now. Uh, so hypermedia is this, well, is it looks all very, uh, sounds very uh, uh, abstract perhaps, but uh, we're all familiar with it. It's the web is, is sort of the most familiar and the most successful hypermedia platform. Uh, and it consists of all different kinds of media. A lot of it is, is text or some kind of markup. But there's also graphics and audio and all that stuff. And there are links between these, 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 these resources on, on the web. Um, and what are sort of the essential ingredients you need to add to a architecture to make it into a hypermedia architecture? Uh, so I think there are just a few basic things. You have these resources and they need to have some form of content type. You need to be able to go to the resource and then find out, and it, can, it tells you what kind of resource it is. I am a PNG file or I am a JSON file is uh, sort of the content type system that's part of the um, uh, HTTP, but you can also be a bit more, more model oriented, like I am an address or I am a customer, that kind of uh, um, sort of more application specific uh, uh, content type. Uh, and then there are hyperlinks between these resources. Uh, and how is hypermedia extensible? Well, you can add new kinds of content to it and you can reconfigure the links, like what places the links point to. Uh, for instance, like at some point the web didn't have PNG support and then, you know, they, they added uh, the PNG content type to web browsers and now suddenly everybody could use that. Um, and uh, you can also, um, you know, extend the application that people see by just adding new links to it and then suddenly you can go to, to different parts of the application again. Um, so, so this, this general principle of, of um, uh, hypermedia is that the hypermedia drives the application state and that has a very wonderful acronym that I don't know how to pronounce. Uh, I'm going to do it anyway, so I'm going to say hate OWASP. Uh, maybe that's all wrong, but I don't know whether anyone can do it right. Uh, so, so the idea is that, that the, the hypermedia system uh, drives the state. So what does that look like in practice? Well, consider a web browser. When you use the web, you go to some start URL, often it's like Google, uh, and then you get links and you click on some links and then the state of your web browser changes and it's based on what link you clicked on. And then the content type that you get, you, maybe you get an image or you get HTML or whatever, uh, that determines what you then see in your web browser and then there's more links and then you can go on and drive the application state that way. So, so in that sense, uh, the hypermedia, the links and the types drive the state of the applications you see. Uh, and it's, it's actually a constraint. It's not like a feature or something. It's a constraint on how you design software. Uh, and the constraint is that the client, in, this, in our example, the web browser, has no hard-coded knowledge about the structure of the URLs on the servers. When you go to a particular website, when you go to the PayPal website, your browser does not know what URLs exist on the PayPal website. It has no idea. It's not hard-coded into the browser because that would be ridiculous. Then the web would not be very extensible, right? We would have to download a new version of the browser as soon as we wanted to access a new kind of website. So instead, uh, uh, this information is sent by the browser as, as this state uh, and, and as links. Uh, and the client, the browser, does not construct URLs. So, so that's another way to express this constraint. URLs are, are not constructed, but they are retrieved from the server. That's sort of a way to think about this rule. There is an exception of that. There could be like a general link construction mechanism that the, uh, uh, the servers can exploit and that the uh, 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 client knows about. And the web form for, for instance, constructing a query uh, uh, string is an example everybody sort of knows. Uh, when you go to Google and you type something and you press enter, the, this query string will appear 
uh, behind the URL. So in that case, the client, the web browser is constructing a URL, but it's only doing this in sort of a very well-defined way. It's not, not a, uh, uh, a new way for each website. Uh, so, so what are the benefits of following that architectural uh, principle? Uh, well, the, the server can be in at least partial control of what you see in the, in the user interface. And if you reconfigure the server, that means the UI becomes different. So you you can uh, you don't have to change the web browser in order to have a new website. You can just change your web server. Uh, and when you're developing, you can have a looser coupling between server and client, which is sort of a general good software architecture principle. Uh, and and you can create user interfaces that are extensible platforms. So this whole core application again uh, with, with with plugins. Or, or that you can configure in some way, uh, and the web browser itself is an example of such an extensible plat uh, platform. And then, sort of the most abstract sort of ideas that it supports the long-term evolvability of applications. And Roy Fielding, who sort of came up with some of these principles, um, and has been involved sort of in, in on in the web for a very long time, sort of thinks about this kind of stuff, and and he attributes these principles to sort of why the web has been around for well, a relatively long time in software and is still able to keep up and evolve uh, without breaking everything, right? So old websites generally still still do something. Um, so let's talk about hypermedia APIs. Um, so uh, I know how to pronounce this word, REST, stands for representational state transfer. And the idea is that, you know, we have this web architecture that we know works well for, for websites and we've been working with it for a very long time. So the idea is to try to uh, gain the benefit of this architecture, the extensibility and the, uh, uh, the long-term term evolution, uh, but for, for APIs, for client-server APIs, where, the, where some software in the web browser or maybe a custom client you write in Python is the client, and then the API is an HTTP server. And uh, so yeah, it's HTTP for APIs, not for UIs. So an API, in a way, is, is a user interface, right? I mean, it's a user interface for developers that need to use it, but it's still a user interface, just a very particular one. Uh, so, um, so the idea, and uh, we see this a lot on the web, is, is this, this HTTP API. Uh, so the client accesses data through the HTTP, it goes through some URL, but then the server typically returns JSON or it might be XML or something else, but, but some kind of data format. Uh, and it's good practice to use like HTTP methods like get and post and put and delete and to that, uh, for the server to send back proper HTTP status codes, there's 204, which most people know about, but there's all kinds of weird ones as well uh, that you can exploit in your architecture. So. Uh, people are, uh, are very familiar with this and, and this kind of API is often called a REST API uh, but most of these APIs aren't actually REST APIs if you go by the original definition of REST uh, so because they don't have hate OAS uh, and it's a requirement for REST you cannot actually according to by the original definition of REST uh, that was written in a paper by Roy Fielding back in I think 2000 or so uh, it's an explicit requirement for, for the way REST is supposed to work, uh, but most of the APIs just have one content type or maybe very few content types. Some of them add content types, but it's maybe all application slash JSON. And most importantly, there are no hyperlinks in, in many of these, the, these, these supposedly REST APIs. Uh, and I keep running into new REST best practices documents everywhere on the web that say this is how you should develop a REST web service, a REST API, and they don't even mention hyperlinks. They just leave out the whole word hyperlink entirely, which is astonishing if you think about the original definition of the word. So people decided to just give up on this original definition. It's been hopelessly sh shifted their meaning, polluted, so people say REST API mean HTTP API. We just give up. I give up. Uh, but we'll call this this thing that's actually the real REST API, we'll call that something else just to have a way to refer to that. So that's a hypermedia API. So that's a HTTP API that follows all these REST best practices plus hyperlinks and, and content types. Uh, and the idea of that is that you will then gain the full benefits of the web architecture for APIs, should you need to have those benefits. Um, and 
one uh, sort of sort of standard that's relatively recent. It's uh, a little over a year old. It's called JSON LD that uh, uh, extends JSON because JSON is kind of a limited format. Um, this is also why it's so successful because it it doesn't do very much and it's very easy to use in languages. Uh, but it's very limited and there's no notion of a, of a content type in JSON and there's also no notion of a link in JSON. You can of course put a URL in a JSON document, but there's no mm. knowledge that is actually a URL, it could be anything. Um, so there's this standard called JSON link data and uh, that sort of extends JSON, builds on top of JSON to let you do stuff like that. And it does all kinds of sort of scary stuff uh, but the sort of the important stuff uh, for this talk I'll, I'll mention here. So uh, here I have an example of, of JSON-LD. Now JSON-LD as a context will completely ignore that for this discussion. Um, uh, JSON-LD documents have a special at ID property and that is a reference to uh, the canonical place, the canonical URL where you can find this resource. Sort of the, the place that you give to other people to find a particular resource. So here we have a JSON LD document that describes an animal, uh, and uh, um, so that the ID says this is where where I'm from. Basically, this is where if you go to that URL, you can find you can find this document. Um, and uh, the other important bit is the the type, uh, the add type, and that's another URL. It doesn't have to refer to anything. Could just be uh, uh, just a URL pointing into the void. There's no particular thing that has to be there sometimes can be an HTML page that describes sort of what what it is uh, and that type um, is just the way so we actually can see what kind of animal or what kind of object we have here in this case we have an animal and I just came up with this this URL it can, it could be anything um, uh, but the idea is that we know that if you get a document with this type then we know we have been expect certain things about it. And in this case, we, ex we expect that it has a name and a title and a description and a list of friends, right? So, uh, and in the context you can describe, I said I wouldn't talk about context, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it. In the context, you can actually describe that in this list of friends, there are links, there are hyperlinks. So the, the client can automatically deduce there are hyperlinks there. Um, so basically just as for the purpose of this talk, an ID and a title, to, uh, to, to JSON uh, in a standard way. So, um, yeah, let's talk a bit about, so, so, so that's a way to do types. And I should mention, of course, you can do the content type header. Uh, uh, you can use that to transfer type information to the client. The problem with that, uh, I mean, I'm sure there's other people who think it's the best way ever, but the problem I see with it is that if you have a nested object, you have a JSON object that contains another JSON object, uh, then, then that type of information you cannot express that in a single content type. So if you embed it in the file itself, in the document itself, you you can you can express that information. So yeah, how do you build a hypermedia API? Well, you use just about any web framework that you can use to build a REST uh, in the new sense of the term API. Uh, you can do, use any web framework, but it can, of course, be done better. There are better web frameworks to build this kind of stuff. And, of course, I'll mention MoPath, which is designed to make it easy and natural to make to build hypermedia APIs, in particular to make links between uh, between items. So MoPath can make hyperlinks for you uh, in what I think is a better way than what most web frameworks do, which is not very much. Uh, you can just link to a Python object, and as long as you've described for its class, like where that what kind of path in the URL uh, that the instances of that class have, uh, it can make the hyperlink for you automatically. Uh, and the other thing that we talked about, extensibility, MoPath takes extensibility very seriously. It's a micro framework, it's very small, but it still allows, I think, more ways to, to construct and to compose and to inherit applications than I've seen in any other Python web framework. And it's very well documented, so if you want to learn more about it, you can go to morepath.readthedocs.org. Um, so now let, let's go into the sort of the, the more speculative part of this, this talk, uh, which is hypermedia user interfaces. Of course, we have again the web as a great example of a working hypermedia user interface. That's the server produces HTML somehow and there are links in there and there's some, some forms that can help you construct links and it's been going strong since 1990, right? So it's a very successful example of a hypermedia 
uh, user interface. It does have limitations. If you want like a highly interactive application that feels more like a desktop application, going back and forth to the server for even small updates in the in the web page can be very clunky, even though we, we did do most of that. I mean, many web applications are still constructed that way and they work fine, but it can be clunky for, for, uh, for a whole range of purposes. Uh, so that's why we've seen in the last decade the rise of single page applications where you send a bunch of JavaScript or other, well, something compiled to JavaScript perhaps to the client, uh, which then update the, uh, uh, the user interface dynamically <coughs> on the client instead of reloading a page. Uh, and the question is, how do we build hypermedia user interfaces in this context? We know how to do it for the classic web, where you have server HTML, but how does this work in uh, in, in, in the rich client side application? Because generally they don't. Uh, rich client side applications generally are backed by new style REST APIs, which don't have hyperlinks, they don't exploit hypermedia at all. They often hard code the, the links to the, to the server in the JavaScript directly. Uh, of course, that you can think of that as hypermedia because you're sending the JavaScript from the server as well. But it, it's not really a hypermedia client. If you change the structure of the link on the server or you add a new content type or whatever, the JavaScript client just will have to be updated, otherwise it just won't work. Um, so, so yeah, why would you want to have a hypermedia-driven UI? Well, you need a UI that's extensible, so you have a core application platform and you want to be able to plug in things easily. Uh, when you want the UI to be reconfigurable by changing stuff on the server without having to change code, but just re rearranging the data. Uh, uh, when you want looser coupling between client and server, so not, not so much hard-coded dependency of the client code on the server code. And if you want to design a UI, for the long term and that often i mean that relates a little bit to this core application with extensions idea because often sort of the business idea behind that is that you have this core application platform and you deploy it in at multiple places but you know it, it this application platform hopefully supports the business and will be around for for decades perhaps so it's, it's, it's a very long time uh, so uh, yeah, rich client application describes sort of the basic idea. So the UI code, JavaScript, runs in the browser. They use AJAX calls uh, uh, to talk to the HTTP API on the server. Uh, they manipulate the DOM in some way to update uh, the, the state of the browser. And there are tons of frameworks out there, and I'm half introducing a new one now. But, uh, um, and yeah, the, that's sort of the state where we are now. Uh, so back in 2010, um, this is looks pretty. Uh, this is the monolith above Jupiter in a movie, 2010, a documentary about this. Well, it's not a documentary, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, it would be light outside now. Actually, Jupiter is probably up. Anyway, um, so 2010. Back in 2010, uh, I, I was building rich client-side web applications um, for customer. And I took REST seriously, so of course my backends were real REST APIs, hypermedia APIs, we would say now, so there were links and all that stuff and, and, and types. And I needed a client-side web framework. And this was 2010, so uh, I had these ideas, like let's create a web framework for the client side and have model view on the client and templates on the client. And then it turned out, you know, as time went by, then I wasn't the only one with that idea. And then, you know, Backbone came around. And, and various others, Amber, Angular, and all that stuff, so the time was ripe for this kind of framework. But I created this thing called OVL that nobody uses. Uh, that's also one of those frameworks. But it's a very good way to learn about the trade-offs in, to create your own framework is a good way to learn about trade-offs in other frameworks, right? Because you have done it already. Um, so how does OVL work? Uh, so you have, a, uh, you have a model object that's just some kind of JavaScript or JSON object and it has a, uh, uh, an iFace property because there was no JSON-LD back then, so I made up my own, but this is effectively like that add type in JSON-LD uh, that I uh, described before. So that identifies what kind of model I have here. I have an example model here, and example model has a name, uh, and then you can define a view in OVL. You can say for example models, this is how, using a template language, this is how you show it uh, on the, uh, uh, on the web page, so you render it in a p tag with hello and then the name of the uh, hello uh, of the name property in there. Um, 
So then where you have some kind of DOM where it has an ID foo in there, uh, and then you say, uh, I extend a jQuery, uh, you render the model which I defined here uh, on the top. I want to render that model in the ID foo there. Uh, what it will do is will insert, it will look up the view based on the interface, based on the, the type, will look up the view, uh, see that it needs to use that template, hello, and then uh, interpolate name in there, and then it will insert that into the, into the web page. So that's sort of the basic principle of Obvio. Uh, and uh, I mean, as you can see, sort of it supports uh, types, right? It's sort of the one half of hypermedia support is here. Within the service and spec type, OVL knows how to respond to it uh, and, and show something. Uh, and the other half is sort of the hyper hyperlink support. So OVL supports rendering uh, a URL like an object. So instead of giving it a, um, a JavaScript object, you can just give it a URL and it will load the URL from the server for you. And then when it gets it, it will look up the type and look up the view for its type and then render the thing there. So that, that's sort of the other idea there. And then this way you can construct nested, you can have a JSON object that points to other ones and then you can sort of render it in a nested way. You can render a whole user interface type. Uh, so it lets you build hypermedia driven UIs even though that term didn't uh, come up to me now uh, uh, or then, not now I sort of I would call it that way. Uh, and, and the idea is that your application that you build with OVL just needs a starting URL. You just give it one root URL of your, 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 your data source and then it just follows links from there and it constructs the whole user interface that way. And the server can change sort of its entire URL structure as long as the links are still the same, the types are the same, the application will still work. And you can also reconfigure the uh, uh, behavior of the user interface by changing the type that you give back from a particular URL or by changing the link to point somewhere else. You can change the behavior of the UI uh, on the server quite uh, quite well. Um, and, and I use this sort of the, the idea that you're changing, I, I had this particular use case during a customer project that I had to change all the URLs in the application uh, because I needed to embed some more state information in there that I didn't have before. And I mean, I used the predecessor of Morpath, so it was very easy to do it on the server as well. So I changed it on the server. I had to change one sort of configuration file or one Python file of code, and the client just worked as before. It didn't have any hard-coded URLs except the starting point, which is also got from the server, of course. And then after that, it just followed links. So all those links were all different, but the client still still worked as before. Uh, but there were flaws with Ovio, uh, besides that nobody ever heard of it. Uh, so, but it has problems as a hypermedia UI framework. Um, so, uh, one of the problems of, of, of OVL is, is spamminess. Uh, so, it follows these links to construct an application. So, if you have a lot of li linked objects uh, to build a UI, we'll need to do a lot of requests to the server, and that's very spammy. Lots of small requests and responses uh, uh, back and forth. Um, and that works for smaller applications that don't need a huge amount of users, but when you need to scale up a little bit, that, that, that becomes a bit slower. Um, another problem is that uh, OVL just replaces whole parts of the DOM uh, in a very coarse-grained way, even if very little changed in it. So it was not very efficient. We got around by that by using all kinds of jQuery plugins that could do updates sort of with themselves, with data sources that didn't really use OVL. Uh, but if you really wanted to update like one little bit, that, that could get a little bit uh, expensive. Um, and, and the biggest problem uh, in OVL is that there was too much knowledge about the UI needed to be in this REST backend. So even though it was a hypermedia backend, the hypermedia backend would need to learn about, uh, we need to know about information of the user interface. It would send back JSON saying, I want to display a menu here and the menu entries are, you know, are behind these links. Uh, but then you're speaking in the language of user interface in your REST backend, and it doesn't, it's not really neutral anymore uh, uh, to, to, to what front end you use. It's, it's really specific to that particular user interface. Uh, so even if it's data driven and it is RESTful, it, it, is, it is a hypermedia uh, uh, API, it's a very specific one. And the backend should really be UI agnostic if you design it well. Uh, 
and it should have types to describe what kind of content you're dealing with more than what kind of UI concept you're dealing with, right? I have an animal here, a human, or an address. In some cases, it really, if your application is about UIs or you have this particular subsystem for constructing forms, it might be entirely okay to construct UIs from, from types you send back from the server. That might be a perfectly fine use case, but you don't want it to be sort of the everywhere in your, your HTTP API. You only want to do this when you really need it, not, not all the time. Uh, so I started thinking about how to resolve these, these issues. So I started thinking about a hypermedia UI framework. Um, so the idea is that to create a framework like OVL uh, that allows you to build hypermedia UIs that solves the problems of UIs. And we can now we're in 2015, so we have newer technologies like flying cars and stuff like that, right? Back to the future too. Flying cars everywhere, pizza rehydrators. I'm sure they were used for the pizzas here, right? So. Uh, uh, they came in this big into the office and then they put them in the machine and they become this way anyway. Uh, so, uh, so we have more modern technology now so, so we can do cool stuff. Uh, so we have JSON-LD now. Uh, and JSON-LD actually, I realized, can help you solve this spamminess problem. So the idea here, here we have this our pigeon again, Fred the Pigeon. And Fred the Pigeon has a, has a friend, Bob the Elephant. I just made it one friend. Uh, uh, in this case, a very lonely pigeon, I guess, but otherwise it won't fit on the screen. Uh, so, uh, uh, in, this, in this case, if you have a UI that wants to display Fred the Pigeon and then all, the, all Fred's friends, we need to load the elephant from its URL. So that, that is an extra HTTP request. One, to get this one, you know, to Fred the Pigeon, that URL, and then to Bob the Elephant. That might be okay, but it might not be okay if you uh, display a complex uh, page. Oh, this is where it falls off the page. You can imagine what... Uh, What's at the bottom? Uh, so the idea here is that instead of actually putting a URL in there, with JSON-LD you can express this nested uh, thing there. So you see there, Bob the Elephant, the ID is there, the type is there, and then information about Bob the Elephant is sort of in there, and then it, sort of the list ends. So uh, if we could send this from the server, then the, our UI could just display Bob, or Fred the Pigeon and Bob the Friend in, in one go without having to do another request, right? So if you could send this back, that would be cool. Um, so, uh, and the idea how to do this is to, JSON-LD has this kind of interesting algorithm and there's a bunch of implementations in Python, there's a PyLD uh, library, there's also a JavaScript library for JSON-LD and, and there's a standardized flatten function which defines how you take a nested structure of, of like we have here of objects with the objects and turn it into a flat tree. And, and all the, uh, the nested objects are basically replaced by their links. But you have a list, so you get a flat list of the items. So you get Fred the Pigeon and you get Bob the Elephant, but you get them in a list and Fred the Pigeon still points to Bob the Elephant, but it's just a reference with the URL. But you have both of them already on the client. Uh, so you can build a store, and I started working on this, this store that stores these flattened objects. And, uh, then the server can just choose, okay, we're having a user interface and we see here that we have a lot of uh, um, requests happening when we display this particular page of our application. Um, how do we reduce this? Well, we can embed some more objects instead of hyperlink them, we just embed the object right away. Uh, and then uh, the store is in charge of all the loading, so it also hides away all the because uh, if you would do this in straight up JavaScript, you would get perhaps kind of nested asynchronous callback hell and all that stuff in UI code. So I abstract all of that stuff in the store. So you just say, give me Fred the Pigeon and please already preload, uh, uh, if you don't have it already, preload uh, Bob the Elephant as well, preload all the friends. And then the store will automatically do one or more requests to the server depending on sort of what, what it got or what it already has. And the client code otherwise doesn't need to change. So the server it gets modified, it embeds extra objects to reduce spamminess. And the idea of this store abstraction is that you can then still have the same client code and it just simply makes less requests, but it still works in the same way. Um, so uh, Morpath is cool because it supports this use case. In Morpath, this is a one-line code change. So if you want to change a link to an embedded object, it's like going from request.link uh, for the object, give me the link for that object, for the elephant or whatever it is, uh, giving me the JSON representation of that object is sort of the second line. So it's a one-line change uh, on the server as well to, 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 to make it less spammy. Um, 
so then we have the coarse grained DOM update store problem that I described. And well, the, the, there's a great solution for this these days. It's called React, uh, which is the most <laughs> obvious like of uh, uh, web frameworks, I think, because it also decomposes the, the, the UI into small components. Uh, and, and it's really great at rendering views much better than OVL was uh, because it uses this virtual DOM strategy to minimize DOM interactions. The basic idea of React is that uh, if you want to present some user interface, uh, you, uh, you basically just pretend like you're rendering the whole web page uh, in some kind of fake tree of, of JavaScript objects of, that, that represent that web page, but it's not the real DOM. Uh, uh, you render it very fast and then you compare that with what you have in the real DOM and you only, only update the bits that have changed. And that way you can really program the client like you did on the server, right? If you send back a whole new HTML page, you just replace everything. Uh, and this is a way to do the same thing almost, uh, re-rendering the whole page, but then very efficiently update the DOM so you still have that fast interactivity uh, that you want. Um, so yeah, change the whole UI and just, just redraw the whole thing fast. Uh, that's sort of the, 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 one of the core ideas of, of React. Uh, consequence of that idea is that it's, it, you don't have to make all kinds of complicated relationships like if this part of the UI is updated and this part of the UI also should be updated with React to just redraw the whole UI all the time anyway. And if you draw the UI correctly the first time, then when something changes, the change version will also be correct. So you don't have to express which many other of these client side web frameworks make you do this. You have to express all these dependencies in your system. Like if this thing changes and that thing also needs to change and can get very messy and complicated uh, with React, you just have to worry about redraw the whole thing. For, yeah, I don't have to think about that kind of stuff. So the idea, okay, we this hypermedia UI framework of the future, uh, let's build it with, uh, with, with, with React uh, to solve this problem. And then we have the uh, sort of the biggest problem, the, the knowledge problem that the server UI um, um, has to know about all these user interface concepts uh, a bit OVL. Uh, so, so OVL is this entirely server driven view lookup system. That's what makes it hypermedia. You get these types back from the server and then it looks up the, uh, uh, the, the, the views based on those types. Uh, React is an entirely client-driven view system. So you have these sort of hard-coded names, so just JavaScript names, and you use them in some kind of not quite template language called JSX that's embedded in your JavaScript. Uh, but it looks very much like HTML, uh, and you can refer to these higher-level concepts. So here, I'm using a few things from the React Bootstrap library, which sort of embeds all kinds of bootstrappy uh, 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 HTMLs, uh, but you can talk in these higher-level UI concepts. And this gets emitted as HTML in the end when the, when the, DOM, when the DOM is updated. Um, so, uh, and that actually is a great way to do this, the UI on the client where it belongs, right? It shouldn't be the, so the server knows about this, the, the, the button toolbars and panels, that should be the job of the, of the client. So you basically want one on both. Uh, well, here is how to create a React component. Um, so you, uh, you create this kind of class-like thing, you give it a name, animal here, and then if you want to display the animal and then the, you know, Fred the pigeon or something like that, you, uh, you just use a little template, GSX template there, and then you can just use it like a tag there. Um, so th that's the React side of things, and then the thing I propose to build on top of that is this special uh, uh, component called HyperRender, and HyperRender uh, with hyperrender, you can associate a React component like animal that we just defined uh, with a type URL. So you say, okay, if I want to render things with that type URL, types animal, then I use the animal React component. So I store it in a registry somewhere, and then when the server gives back this thing with type animal, uh, well, I can just render whatever whatever I get back from the server. So I just say render this particular model and it will look up the appropriate React component for you uh, based on the type of what you uh, pass in and then dynamically put in whatever bit of the view you have there. And that's what, what makes the UI hypermedia driven. Um, so the idea is to, to use a hybrid system, to use normal React components where you're talking about the UI and to use hyper-render where you want to be parts of your UI, you want to put in slots 
that you want to be driven by server state. You want to be, uh, so if the server sends back an animal, then you want to show an animal there, but if the server shows back a, uh, an airplane type, then you want to show the UI for the airplane type there. You have a list of animals and suddenly there's an airplane in there, that will just work because it will also just, it will use the airplane rendering, uh, uh, airplane view there, uh, and it will be, that will be server driven. Um, so I, I started working on this. I call the project Hyperstate, uh, and the idea is to have a client-side web framework that's based on React and JSON LD that allows for this kind of hypermedia-driven UI and it has this hyperstore to take care of the spamminess issue and abstract away server loading uh, and to use hyperrender to do the to, to, to do the hypermedia type-driven story uh, and. I'm still thinking about how to do client-side routing in this kind of scenario. You still want URLs to change, even if you, I mean, normally when you use a server-side web application, the URLs change, you can bookmark them, press the back button, all that stuff works. As soon as you do everything in the client, that, that's completely broken, and you need to have a system that brings that back again. And there are various routing solutions that the various client-side frameworks offer, but I think for, for hyperstate, we'll need, need something uh, slightly different, because you know, the whole architecture is slightly different. Uh, so I'll show a sort of a hand-waving example of what what a very simple hyperstate application might look like in the future when there is actually is a code base called a hyperstate that actually works. Um, so, so here we have some, some data. We have two objects uh, that sort of describe some characters in the Terminator 1 movie. So we have the T-800 cyborg there, which is of type cyborg and it has a designation and then uh, somebody it wants to kill and somebody wants to protect nobody in Terminator 1 as far as I know uh, and then you have Sarah Connor uh, who, who has the same URL unfortunately as the, as the kill uh, uh, URL in the, uh, in the T-800 uh, uh, so the T-800 clearly wants to kill Sarah Connor and, and has a type human right so that's Terminator 1 uh, and now we're going to define a few views for them uh, using a fictional hyperstate uh, API, uh, uh, which is very similar to React. It just adds this type story here. So um, what we say for the cyborg type, we want to render the cyborg and in a div with the designation of the cyborg. I actually should write this dot props dot designation. My apologies when you see this dot designation, it should be this this dot props. Same with this dot name below. Uh, uh, that's React. Um, so, and then for human, we want to show the human and then the name of the human in the div. Um, and then uh, we want to have also a special detail view, which has a different name than the main view for the cyborg, uh, that displays the details of the cyborg in our application. And we want to show the uh, the, um, uh, the the designation of the cyborg. So we just re-render. The, our, if we render a cyborg object with the details view, we say, okay, well, first render at the top, a hyper render object is this dot props. I should put it in curly braces. Uh, you see with fictional code, it doesn't work. Uh, so when, you, um, when that first hyper render happens, it will look up the non details view, so the first view here uh, for the cyborg, and it will show the cyborg and then the designation of the cyborg. And then it will show the target of the cyborg. Uh, it will show the the kill prop, uh, uh, property, and it will automatically resolve that URL for you uh, if you configure it right. And you show the uh, uh, protect uh, uh, what the protect link points to as well here. Uh, and then when we uh, say, okay, please render the th hundred URL and using the details view, then what it should show is well cyborg th 800 and then the target is sarah connor and it protects nobody um, so, so now we have a, sort of a reconfigured our server for terminator 2 uh, uh, because in terminator 2 the, the link structure is different right we still have the same types we still have uh, cyborgs and humans but it's different now we have john connor as a new character besides Sarah Connor, also a human, and they have a T-1000, and the T-1000 uh, is trying to kill John Connor, protect nobody, and we've reconfigured on the same URL that we had before, we've reconfigured the T-800, the T-800 now wants to uh, uh, 
uh, wants to kill the T1000 and protect John Connor, right? So it has changed quite a bit. But we can still reuse our same views, right? So if we now render the T T800, then we'll see that the target is the cyborg, not a human anymore. So that's where you see it's it, it's really type-based, right? So it's not hard-coded that the target was a human. I mean, the previous example, the target was just whatever you link to as the target. As long as we can render something for it, it will show the right thing. So the target is the T1000, uh, and we want to protect the human, not, uh, and, you know, we want to protect somebody in the first place, the human John Connor, right? And if you have a Terminator 6, and you know the T800 is trying to kill another T800 or whatever, that would all still be possible with our, with our existing views. Uh, and of course we could extend if, if Terminator 6 happens to have kind of a new kind of character that's a zombie or whatever, zombies are very popular, then you know we could, we could, add, in, uh, we could add a zombie type, right? And then you could start using it. So that, those are ways to reconfigure your server, to change the behavior of the client um, and to extend applications. So we yeah, had the state of hyperstate, I've been thinking about this for a while, and I started to write the code, uh, actually seriously this week, so the store, the hyperstore, sort of getting there, there are actually tests, and I have a prototype version of hyperrender, uh, and I'm thinking very hard about a routing system now, but I haven't really written any code yet, uh, but I'm quite familiar with routing systems after my ZOAP career, and then more path and all that stuff, to, uh, to have some ideas. Um, so yeah, in conclusion, I hope you, you, you learn a little bit about hypermedia from this talk at least, and that I interested you in the possibilities that hypermedia UIs can, can, can give you. And if you're interested in this kind of stuff and you want, want to talk about it and brainstorm or whatever, then please talk to me. Um, and uh, thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. So this is super interesting. Um, so you mentioned that you see like CRM systems or um, the ERP systems in general with Flake for this. And I can definitely see uh, having there on the Dodo, which is an unholy mess of XML. But, yeah. but, so if you're loading an initial page, how are you imagining the payload to come the first time? Like, is it just my page, top panel gets loaded, this thing is loaded, that thing is loaded, that thing? Well, so, so, so the idea is that, yes, so, so, so the idea is that you, um, and I didn't show this here, that you can, you can say, so you get, you start with one URL, right, that's the hypermedia idea. So you start with one URL that's the root of all your data that might point to other sort of parts of your application. And then you, uh, you, you look at its type, you look up a view for it, and then sort of it nests that way through to build user interface. Uh, but what you can express is, um, uh, so, so in, if you implemented it naively, there would be a lot of requests to, to load up a whole page. And yeah, when it gets a URL in there, it will need to go to the store and say, please give me this URL. If the store doesn't already have uh, something for that URL, we'll have to go fetch it. And you'll have to wait until that part of the user interface updates. But because we have this store, we can solve that spamminess problem by saying, okay, when we have an initial page, maybe we'll have two requests instead of, I mean, maybe well, it's, it's more than one request, but that's a very simple case of initial page. If it was give everything nested already, or just a list of additional objects that you know the initial page needs, due to that flattening algorithm, it can store all of them, preload them into the store already. So as soon as it tries to access those additional URLs, it looks at the store and say, hey, I already have that, so I'm just giving you back that, instead of having to go off again. And that way you can transparently reduce the spamminess of the user interface, so that's the, the, the basic idea. And you can express per, per type, uh, which things, so, so when you have a type, um, since it gets flattened, all the nested objects are gone again, uh, but you can express per type how, how you re which ones you want to reconstitute, basically, or maybe per view, I'm not sure yet, but per, re yeah, per, per view, I think. So you, re you register per view, uh, that I want all the friends to be loaded as well automatically and actually be in there as soon as I start rendering the view. But yeah, as, as long as the server just gives you optimistically, gives you extra information that it just knows you need anyway, uh, the client doesn't have to be waiting for anything. Right. Oh, so okay. for my foundation, they close the idea that it would be more like the server just kind of, there's a lot of JSON that you're probably going to need. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's this whole discussion in the JavaScript world about isomorphic uh, uh, things where you already pre-render the UI in HTML on the, on the server for initial loads. Uh, that's important for like really Google scale applications, but for the applications that, that, that we, you see, well, be beneath the iceberg, I think that's a concern that's a little bit over, you know, it's given a lot of importance, but for many applications, that's not really that important. So let's simplify it and not render anything on the server. The important part is in the Google ranking. Yeah, yeah. You can see the same thing about the PNG methods, perhaps, where the server can automatically bundle up all PNGs that you'd likely to want. Yeah, give well, you a, a yeah. bigger file with the, I'm rather, rather yeah. than ask for 100 images, here's an icon file, essentially. Which yeah, there are, these, there are, there are these, these approaches to do, uh, I mean, there's even HTTP2, right? I mean, there, there, are, there are these sort of new protocols and various sort of things proposed and already existing that let you uh, preload static assets, basically. Um, so that that's similar, but but not the same, because these are much more dynamic assets that you're, you're getting at. Anything else? I was that clear <laughs> or unclear. <laughs> so, yeah. Maybe a little bit part of what Bjorn is saying is um, so some part of the UIs, they are, so you mentioned like a, um, the view and representation of an object, which can be like simple, and then uh, like a detailed view. But often we have to deal with uh, stores which deal with a collection of objects. So some, like they say, give me a list of addresses, right? But because again, you don't want to actually don't want to pull all the data out of right, server, right? right? You have like the pagination issues, like right. the filtering, sorting. Right. This kind of stuff are like standard operations on uh, on on lists of of objects, which are also views in themselves. So, so my thinking in that sort of that's when you're talking about. So, so one one way to do deal with large amounts of data on the server is to deal with is to do pagination, and pagination is just a next and a previous link, and then you know you can. Uh, I don't think that that is a big issue for the store. And, but the other sort of aspect is 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 queries, right? Where you have a query with some dynamic information, and you want to construct the query, um, and uh, yeah. that's where you sort of you get into the territory of the client constructing URLs um, and there is this, this RFC that lets you um, 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 uh, that's called the URI template RFC that, that sort of helped it. so the idea is that the, the server would send a URI template a template of, of, a, of a query to the client and then the client can then in inspect that and use that to, to dynamically generate the queries very much like HTML form works but maybe that's not exactly your question uh, I, I don't think it's a big issue uh, if you just give back, you know, you, you don't want to give back all data all the time, right? You don't need all data on the client, uh, you just give back the data that, yeah. that actually you need it. Between, uh, sort of, if you expose certain links on an object, which is like your, your, the stuff you work with, so your UI objects uh -huh. are, have different properties and, and why they exist, and actually help you to right. abstract sets of objects. Right. So, but at the same time, we need to know a little bit about the object to know how oh, this object is actually or Right, right, object. right. So, so the idea so is that, yeah. Yeah, you connect that, to the, so you hook it all up to the type, right? So the view needs to know about this stuff, but the view can rely on, so as long as you your view knows that it works for a certain type, it can assume all kinds of things about these objects. Uh, um, there are like standards uh, in the works like uh, uh, Hydra, which is built on top of uh, JSON-LD to try to, and there's a whole bunch of other proposals that try to really abstractly uh, specify REST APIs, so hypermedia APIs with collections and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of different stuff going on there, but you don't need it. Uh, I mean, it would be useful to have this kind of stuff, but you don't need it to construct uh, a hypermedia UI because you can rely on the, as soon as long as you know the object is certain type you can make all kinds of assumptions on what's in the object after that you don't need to uh, I mean it's nice to be able to introspect the information and all that stuff about particular types and then know what's there but it's not necessary to do that you, you could hard code that you're still hard coding a lot less than when you're hard coding 
both the information about the types you expect from the server, which you do in a traditional HTTP API as well, uh, and the URL structure of the server. You will hard code that in the in the client if you do it sort of the non-hypermedia way. In this case, you'd still hard code information about types, but you don't hard code information anymore about URLs. So you're still more loosely coupled as a result of that. Your, your mysterious acronym, I think it begs to be pronounced heinous. Heinous. No, hate us. Because of, <laughs> so you have, to, you have to think of another one. Yes, well, I didn't come up with the acronym, it's somebody else so, uh, who invented that one. I, I, maybe there is an established way to pronounce it, but I, you know, I, I deliberately didn't look it up anymore because you know I just thought it would be funnier if I didn't know. Um, I do have a bonus slide if there are no more questions. So, oh, there are questions, very good. <laughs> OVL stood for object, a view, element. So the idea was to, to associate objects with views and, ele and elements. You have to come up with some name, right? So, so that's why. I think hyperstate sounds cooler, but it's, you know, I just came up with it, so that just sounds better anyway. Yeah. Sounds very Dutch. Hyperstate. OVL. Yeah, it sounds like an elf from, from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you back there? Yeah. It is not an Okay. Hate, but does it hate Aeos? But there's an O there. What anyway, yeah, okay. Well, well. That's not the, uh, the Singlish pronunciation of, of that word, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. Hey, Theos. Okay. All right. Fine. There was another hand somewhere? No? There. Yeah. Sorry, could you go duplication between server and that? Is that a? For example, uh, the client side is fine. Sometimes I want to look up the URL. Uh, that part is in the URL. Uh, and then the client side. Right, so, so the idea is to do everything on the client side that has anything to do with UIs, right? So there's no HTML generated on the server at all. So that's one way to avoid co duplication. Yeah, it would be when you want to build an interactive sort of more desktop application-like thing than, than a traditional website. And there are very good use cases to make a website with multiple, where the server generates uh, uh, HTML and where you enhance it with a little bit of JavaScript. I mean, there are, there are great reasons to do this. So this is more oriented towards building these interactive modern web applications, but still getting some of the benefits of the web uh, that we've sort of lost uh, along the way, right? We're getting them back again, uh, the hypermedia benefit. So, oh, I need to log in again. <laughs> if I want to show my bonus slide. Right, so I'll go to the uh, special bonus slide now. So, uh, Last year, somebody here asked me about more path performance. You know, it's the question everybody always asks about web frameworks. And then we have this extremely insightful and accurate hello world test that really tells you nothing, right? It's a benchmark. Uh, so, so last year when I measured it, I just started measuring it and it was as fast as Flask, which was the, uh, it's about 6,000 requests per second on doing hello world. Uh, so uh, Flask is actually, uh, people tend to be surprised about this, but Flask is one of the slower web frameworks out there. People think Flask is pretty lightweight and easy, so it's pretty fast too, but it's not. It's actually one of the slower ones out there. Django is faster than Flask. So half a year ago when I had done some optimization work, uh, it was faster than Django at about 9,800 requests per second, and I did some more refactoring, and now it's uh, at 14,500 requests per second. I measured it today. Uh, 
priority, I mean, of Mopath is not performance. Uh, I think the performance, I mean, since nobody complains about Flask performance, uh, for, for the, the Mopath is more than fast enough. But you see a lot of sort of noise about performance of uh, web frameworks. If you really want a high performing web framework that's boring and doesn't do anything nice for you, uh, that's just like all the other ones, you need to go elsewhere. Uh, uh, and they're much faster than more path at the low world but if you want the extensibility and, and the linking and all that stuff you know th that's why you should go to more path not for performance but since we had this question here last year and that put me on the whole performance trail I thought I'd, uh, I'd get back to that okay thank you Thanks, very small uh, announcement.